reminiscent stories for tomorrow or today at cocktails and dinner. Uh, but I do have to say it's wonderful to be here in Boston. I want to thank Northeastern University uh, for doing this. This has been a joint venture by Northeastern and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, Las Vegas. Boyd School of Law, Tom Main is really one of the driving forces of this to try and honor uh, Steve, uh, even though it would be a, no, no attempt will fully do that. Tom unfortunately had uh, some family matters that prevented his uh, being here and he sends his regards to everybody. Uh, things are, are fine, but he needed to be uh, at home. And um, I must say that in Tom uh, uh, personifies one of the many ways in which Steve has been such an amazing citizen of the civil procedure world as a mentor uh, and, and as a teacher. I, I can't think of a more treasured colleague than Tom. And, and he was formed uh, in the crucible of the super and civil procedure class here at Northeastern, as uh, so many have been. Um, Steve, of course, you know, is a friend and a mentor and a great teacher, uh, but also a great scholar. And so the real emphasis of the next day and a half or so will be uh, scholarly examination of many of the important issues in civil procedure that uh, Steve has uh, written on and spoken to uh, over the years. Um, uh, I do want to just, uh, uh, I, I should, in that vein, I should say I made the mistake of asking our law library, would you put together the bios of the speakers just in case I get brain freeze, you know, and need to, you know, have something in front of me when we're introducing them. And this is what he brought me. <laughs> it's a form book, which I think is a testimony to the really uh, wonderful <laughs> caliber of the speakers and panelists that we have uh, today. Uh, and we're just not going to be able to do it justice. So when Margaret and I will be taking Margaret Wu, who is uh, the, uh, along with Tom uh, and I, one of the organizers of the uh, content of the program, uh, we'll be uh, uh, moderating these panels alternatively during uh, the next two days. And when we give you very brief introductions, uh, please don't take it personally. We can't do anybody justice. We do have extensive bios of everybody in the folders you got uh, at check-in. And when you have really important speakers like that, do they have a lot to say? <coughs> well, we have a very tight schedule, as you can see. And so we have brought along, I want to introduce, uh, in addition to this wonderful live proceeding, we're going to have the uh, proceedings of the articles that emanating from this published in a future issue of the Nevada Law Journal. I want to introduce Brittany Gallo and Erica Nanini from the Law Journal who will be approaching many of the speakers to introduce themselves and work with you on the production of the articles. I've also drafted them as timekeepers with these handy dandy uh, time signs that will be shown to people. But in the spirit of the new normal of legal education and frugality, the note on this from one of the secretaries is, um, uh, Tom, Jeff, return to Maria. Meet back next Tuesday. <laughs> so, so this is our one set of time cards that I'm going to uh, entrust to our uh, speakers here. And of course, we'll be playing um, militant and uh, heading about that to keep people on time. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our, our host this weekend, and I want to thank him again for the wonderful job Northeastern has done, uh, Dean Jeremy Paul, who has been the Dean of Connecticut prior to Northeastern. You all know Jeremy from his scholarship. I still think getting to maybe is perhaps the best how to be a first year law student book I've ever read. And I must say, we were very interested in trying to recruit Jeremy when we were in a Dean search some years ago. Couldn't even get him to get on the plane to the Northeast. Uh, to do this, but he's done a wonderful job at two law schools and has been uh, a tremendous force in legal education. He'll be introducing our keynote speaker, Judge Gertner, uh, with that, Jeremy Paul. and stories for tomorrow or today at cocktails and dinner. Uh, but I do have to say it's wonderful to be here in Boston. I want to thank Northeastern University uh, for doing this. This has been a joint venture by Northeastern and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada, Las Vegas. Boyd School of Law, Tom Main is really one of the driving forces of this to try and honor uh, Steve, uh, even though it would be a, no, no attempt will fully do that. Tom unfortunately had uh, some family matters that prevented his uh, being here, and he sends his regards to everybody. Uh, things are, are fine, but he needed to be uh, at home. And um, I must say that in Tom uh, uh, personifies one of the many ways in which Steve has been such an amazing citizen of the civil procedure world as a mentor uh, and, and as a teacher. 
I, I can't think of a more treasured colleague in Tom, and, and he was formed uh, in the crucible of the Super and Civil Procedure class here at Northeastern, as uh, so many have been. Um, Steve, of course, <coughs> you know, is a friend and a mentor and a great teacher, uh, but also a great scholar. And so the real emphasis of the next day and a half or so will be uh, scholarly examination of many of the important issues in civil procedure that uh, Steve has uh, written on and spoken to uh, over the years. Um, uh, I do want to just, uh, uh, I, I should, in that vein, I should say I made the mistake of asking our law librarian, would you put together the bios of the speakers just in case I get brain freeze, you know, and need to, you know, have something in front of me when we're introducing them. And this is what he brought me. <laughs> it's a form book, which I think is a testimony to the really uh, wonderful caliber of the speakers and panelists that we have uh, today. Uh, and we're just not going to be able to do it justice. So when Margaret and I will be taking Margaret Wu, who is uh, the, uh, along with Tom uh, and I, one of the organizers of the uh, content of the program, uh, we'll be uh, uh, moderating these panels alternatively during uh, the next two days. And when we give you very brief introductions, uh, please don't take it personally. We can't do anybody justice. We do have extensive bios of everybody in the folders you got uh, at check-in. And when you have really important speakers like that, do they have a lot to say? <coughs> well, we have a very tight schedule, as you can see. And so we have brought along, I want to introduce, uh, in addition to this wonderful live proceeding, we're going to have the uh, proceedings of the articles that emanating from this published in a future issue of the Nevada Law Journal. I want to introduce Brittany DeLone and Erica Nanini from the Law Journal who will be approaching many of the speakers to introduce themselves and work with you on the production of the articles. I've also drafted them as timekeepers with these handy dandy uh, time signs that will be shown to people. But in the spirit of the new normal of legal education and frugality, the note on this from one of the secretaries is, um, uh, Tom, Jeff, return to Maria. Meet back next Tuesday. <laughs> so, so this is our one set of time cards that I'm going to uh, entrust to our uh, speakers here. And of course, we'll be playing um, militant and uh, heading about that to keep people on time. Now I'd like to introduce uh, our, our host this weekend, and I want to thank him again for the wonderful job Northeastern has done, uh, Dean Jeremy Paul, who has been the Dean of Connecticut prior to Northeastern. You all know Jeremy from his scholarship. I still think getting to maybe is perhaps the best how to be a first year law student book I've ever read. And I must say, we were very interested in trying to recruit Jeremy when we were in a Dean search some years ago. Couldn't even get him to get on the plane to leave the Northeast. Uh, to do this, but he's done a wonderful job at two law schools and has been uh, a tremendous force in legal education. He'll be introducing our keynote speaker, Judge Gertner, uh, with that, Jeremy Paul. Um, um, I, I've gotten, a, I, I've, I learned a little bit about academics already, and I've gotten a grant for the purposes of completing a book that I have not begun. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, I know you're trying to get things done, but at the end of the day, you have to have an 
Irish coffee. <laughs> now I know it should have been a scotch and water, but you know, I, I don't drink that much. Uh, so I'm giving you uh, pseudo Irish coffee. <laughs> I couldn't find the coffee today. Um, they took it away from me. But here's your Irish coffee. You can um, um, give your, uh, your final kind of closing remarks. <laughs>
with our spouses, significant others, and friends. What a matter of just good fortune um, that that happened. I mean, what about the fact that here I'm a lawyer and get trained by the same people as Larry Struel who turn out to be among the best lawyers and teachers I have ever known. And what about the idea of I decide to leave there and there's this crazy new law school that's open um, that just happens to represent the major things I believe in. First, that you learn the most by doing things. Second, that each of us as lawyers have an obligation to make the world a better place. And third, that acting cooperatively among the faculty and students and the staff is a substantially better way to go to law school. And what about the good fortune of running into Margaret, who introduces me to an entirely new culture three times and gets the Ford Foundation to pay for it? <laughs> or what about the fact of sitting in a restaurant in New York with Rich, bored out of our minds at the ALS? <laughs> you know what, let's next time have four or five people in civil procedure who will get a restaurant and we'll talk, you know, we'll be our own friends, we'll have a reason to go to the ALS convention, turning into the Field Family Forum that for many of us is the reason we go to the ALS. <laughs>
And it's become so obvious that when the advisory committee does anything very, or tries to do anything very dramatic, it's a political thing. It's a political thing they shouldn't be doing and they don't have the power to do. It's particularly true now that they know that the Supreme Court will do it for them. <laughs> um, so I think that might help account for the keeping of the status quo. Second favorite quote has been Maitland, who said, equity without the common law is a castle in the air. I mean, haven't we discovered that? That what's happened is we've basically created an almost entirely discretionary system. And the result of that is what we now know that in such a system, the biases of the people involved will play out. And what we all know now is that the cognitive biases are directly against the interest of the people who most need the protection of some types of rules that actually have some clout to them and will give protection. The third quote that has influenced me for my lifetime in civil procedure, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy don't see $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise examined in any court of the United States and according to the rules of the common law. Those wise colonists and their leaders absolutely understood the dual dangers of either centralized power in very small, few people and the other danger of mass hysteria going wild. They did everything in their power when they became the leaders in the country to try to figure out how can you keep a balance between, in a democracy that will escape the dangers of oligarchy and complete power in a few people and the mass hysteria that we've seen so much in the 20th and 21st century. And a major way that they tried to accomplish that was with the American jury. The fact that you would have a balance between a judge educated as a lawyer with a sense of responsibility to the law and a group of everyday citizens who could con counterbalance that great power. I mean, think about it. Think of the importance of open court, the importance of the drama, the drama of hu real human beings so that the judge and jury have to take into account the consequences of what they're deciding. They have to have in front of them real people whose lives they are influencing with their decisions. Think of the importance of having everyday Americans who the only other part of government they can usually take is voting, actually participating in a democracy. That's a huge, huge deal. Think of the importance to them of having lawyers talk orally to a judge and a jury, getting their attention so they actually listen. Think of the importance that they had in lawyers having to reduce complex cases 
and ordinary cases in a way that 12 people, good and true, could understand. I ask you, if we who have dedicated so much of our adult lives to civil procedure, civil litigation, and know precisely what is going on, do not take on this struggle, who will 